Welcome to the Intimate Marriage Podcast, where I teach educated, successful couples how to have incredible, passionate relationships so that you can stop compromising and start feeling fully alive in your relationship. I'm Alexandra Stockwell, aka The Intimacy Doctor. I'm a physician, a relationship and intimacy coach, and I'm an intimate marriage expert. My husband and I have been married for 26 years. We have four children and full professional lives, and we've created an amazing marriage. I've shown hundreds of couples how to do so as well. So if you want to deepen your understanding of your own relationship and learn to access new heights of emotional, sensual, and erotic intimacy, you're in the right place. I will show you how. Now, let's dive in. For those of you listening to this episode, right when it drops, November 21st, it is Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving 2022, and I'm specifically dropping this episode today because it is the busiest travel day of the entire year. That was even true during the pandemic, but it was certainly true before, and we can imagine it's likely to be true going forward, because this podcast is a celebration, of course, of marriage, of thriving together, of building a life together, but it also is a celebration of travel. I want to warmly welcome our travelers, the most beautiful couple, Marilee and Paul, welcome to the Intimate Marriage Podcast. Well, thank you, Dr. Alexandra. We're, we're delighted to be here. Absolutely delighted, yes. I want to set the scene because I attended a woman's business event where I met, in fact, I haven't said your last names, but I'm going to have the two of you say your last names. <laughs> they have a bit of poetry to them. So will you say your last name? Well, I am Marilee Costadimus. And I am Paul Costadimus. Yes. Okay, that sounds good. Well, <laughs> I met Marilee Costadimus at an event where I think there were about 30 women present, all CEOs, founders, entrepreneurs, competent women who know how to make things happen, who otherwise wouldn't have been at this event. And it was time to take the picture. And you would think that every one of these competent women was a kind of mushy pussycat the way that you stepped in, Marilee, with vision and clarity. These people who are not used to taking orders from anyone were moving a little to the left and opening their eyes and shifting posture because it was so clear you had this tremendous vision and the only normal thing would be to submit, surrender, and participate. And I just thought, okay, I want to interview you and your beloved because I want to hear more about how you move through the world. And I will just say a little bit more of introduction that Marilee and Paul Costadimus are travel partners in life, through life, and for life, their biographies are respectively and together very fascinating. But the thing I specifically want to say is their company is called Spotlight Sojourns, and it has the mission to inspire and connect travel doers and dreamers with travel, tourism, and hospitality brands through visual storytelling because meaningful travel is part of a meaningful life. So if you happen to be at a busy airport with delayed flights while you're listening, or maybe you're just in your humdrum routine dreaming of travel, meaningful travel is part of a meaningful life. And telling the stories about the travel enriches the meaning. So with that, I'd love to invite the two of you to share your love story to open up how travel came to be so important for both of you. Thank you, Alexandra. Well, meaningful travel, experiential travel, immersive travel, those moments that echo in memory, that's meaningful travel. 
And meaningful travel has been part of our story from the very beginning. We met as graduate students from two different countries on an archaeological dig in Greece. We were engaged under the creation of Adam Fresco in the Sistine Chapel in Rome, Italy. And we were married under the Golden Gate Bridge on a warm sunset in San Francisco, California. Now, when we met, he is a classically trained photographer and I'm a writer. And I said to him that long ago summer, your pictures, my words, our travel. Well, then we went corporate. (laughs) (laughs) Paul went into litigation management and software consulting. And I went into destination management, corporate events and meetings, and my specialty incentive travel. And travel was always the constant, but that long ago promise faded away. Until one moment in Lisbon, Portugal, right before the world shut down. We strolled hand in hand into a nondescript piazza. It was a small traffic roundabout. And we stopped, suddenly transformed by what we saw, literally the handwriting on the wall. Four simple words, hand scrawled on plain white paper, scotch taped to wrought iron balcony. Collect moments, not things. And we knew it was time. There was a little cafe under the signs, and we sat right down, ordered pastries and coffee, and began to sketch out the transformation from strategists for some of the world's biggest companies to content creators and visual storytellers for travel, tourism, and hospitality brands. His pictures, my words, and yours too. And that led us to us, our conversation here today. I want to ask you all kinds of things about the content that you've said, but I'm having a very personal moment because my grandparents were married for 50 years before my grandmother died. And my grandmother was eloquent, loquacious, probably a bit more flirtatious than you reveal yourselves to be, Marilee. She flirted with waiters and all kinds of others, but she was just incredibly articulate and filled the space with her beautiful words such that, and they were in business together, such that people thought my grandfather just really didn't like speaking. (laughs) But the thing is that once she had passed, he just told stories and dominated conversation in this beautiful way for the rest of his life. And so we learned that he actually had far more to say than he chose to, than the dynamic they had was conducive to. Mm -hmm. So without actually turning that into a particular question, I'd love to invite you to share your response, Paul. Well, I sound very much like your grandfather, I believe. (laughs) Um, The thing is, Mary Lee is um, so lyrical in, in her speech that she always does it more justice when she recounts a story. I I tend to be more economical with words, so it's not quite the same uh, picture that gets formed. But I can what I can add to that particular moment, because it was a moment, um, I quickly, after we ordered our coffee, I quickly grabbed my camera, backtracked a bit, and took a photo of the scene. So we would have just the memory of it, because it was such a transformational moment for us. And one photo, just quick snapshot, not anything, uh, you know, uh, award-winning or anything like that. And we sat down, we had our coffee and pastries, and we started planning and and thinking and whatever we could figure out at, at the moment at the time. Then later that evening, we happened to walk by the piazza again, and the words were gone. The posters that 
the, the, the written words that were on the wrought iron were not there anymore. In fact, I said to Mary Lee, let's go back because I'm going to take a better photo. And um, so it was, it was like a divine message that was sent to us for that time and that moment. And we seized that moment. When couples travel, it's sometimes a litmus test. Let's say a couple has been together for a while. I, I know, and I don't know if this is something that people do now in their 20s and 30s. I'm 54, and I certainly remember in my in my time that somebody wouldn't want to commit to a relationship until they'd traveled together, because it reveals so much. Would you speak to that phenomenon, both generally and in your own marriage? I concur with that observation, Alexandra, and I believe you will as well. Absolutely. I have a story about this as well. You do. Because we met on the road, again, we were on an archaeological dig in Greece on the island of Paros. And after the dig, we traveled with others through Italy before we said goodbye at Fumicino. And I went back because my graduate school was starting and you stayed longer abroad. So that experience in the heat of summer and the the work on the dig actually alexander you are down in a trench six feet deep sometimes much deeper and you are working under the broiling hot sun for hours after hours a day and then when you're done you're writing up in your your dig diary and your cleaning artifacts and it is hard work and all the artifice and the superficiality that that we have to get through daily life are stripped away and you see people for who they really are because you can't hide it and then with the travel experience following that just continued so i understood who he was from the very beginning And equally importantly, you understood who I was from the very beginning. So that enabled us to come together and be together with a level of of understanding and truth and clarity that I think we would not have in a typical environment. Right, where one can camouflage both consciously and unconsciously who one is in the general relatively mundane every day and all that gets stripped away and then you you see what you get what was the story you were going to tell paul so travel um i i got the traveling bug early in in life um partly because i'm i didn't move a lot but i moved drastically in growing up and the uh, the travel bug um, is persistent within my entire family. Most most of my siblings, and I have six, five siblings. There's six of us. Which number um, are you? All, I'm number six. Okay. I'm the I'm what well, as they like to call me the baby of the of the family. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm grown man, but I'm the baby of the family. Always will be. So, uh, any. Anywhere you could probably think of uh, in Asia, Africa, Europe, um, South America, within the North America, my family, ha- somebody in my family has has been. Um, so travel was very important to me. And having a good travel partner is critical because if you're not simpatico, then you have different uh, goals, that you have different interests. And uh, as an example, um, I traveled one summer with my nephew. He, he and I grew up like brothers. We we're very close in age. Uh, he likes the beach life, and I liked, you know, the the archaeological sites and the, and the the stones. Uh, so we had to compromise when we were traveling to to be able to accomplish both. So uh, so much so that one year I took six weeks and traveled throughout. Greece, and I did it by myself because it was, you know, I was going to get the kind of experience I wanted. So when I met Mary Lee, 
that was something that was important that we see how how, how we travel because it, it is a big part of my life. And it is, of course, a big part of Mary Lee's life, but I didn't know that at the time. So we, um, when we left the Greek island of Potters, we took a big ferry to go to the, the main uh, port in, La- in Athens, Piraeus. And Mary Lee had a, um, a, one of those rolling duffel bags that are, that are like six feet long. And I was, in essence, a buck- backpacker because I was backpacking through Europe <laughs> back then. And I said to her, this is not going to work this way, being, you know, dragging, dragging your, your rollboard with you. In fact, I, um, I, I set a rule that, you know, she had to carry her own, her own suitcases. That was the rule of the travel. Um, and it, this was an expensive duffel bag. It was leather. It was brand new. It was beautiful. She had gotten it just for the, for the trip. And the minute we landed in Piraeus, we went straight into the have like a flea market area there. We found the perfect backpack that fit her. She took everything out of the duffel, put it in the backpack, and just left the duffel bag behind. Uh, one of our uh, colleagues ended up taking it home with them. Um, and she just strapped on that backpack and off we went. And that's how our travel started. It's so amazing. When you talk about different travel styles, I'm actually reminded of my sister-in-law, um, my husband and I and our children and my brother and sister-in-law and their children haven't traveled together in many, many years. But when we did, even if we went and stayed, let's say, on Montauk at the end of Long Island, and they might have been there for three weeks and we'd visit for one, my sister-in-law would research everything. She would know all of the options for lunch and for dinner and which activities and mini golf on Tuesday and going to the beach on Wednesday. I mean, she had an itinerary. Let me just say that my brother-in-law is a PhD, but otherwise the rest of us are physicians. We know how to organize our schedule. We know how to fit a lot of things in. Like we, we all have a certain amount of type A in us. However, when I go on vacation, I don't want to plan anything. I mean, I want to know I have a place to stay or that I'm going to be able to. But part of the thrill of vacation for me is the lack of decision making and the opportunity for spontaneity. So the way that I handled that with my sister-in-law is just whatever she wanted to do, she would always be considered and ask me. But I'd always say, it's fine because it just it was going to be fine wherever we went. But these are, I'm like spelling this out because I think people who travel a lot would immediately know what you're talking about with different travel styles. I love the example you've gave in terms of the kind of luggage, but for people who haven't traveled a lot or haven't traveled with people who are different, I just wanted to spell out a little bit of what kinds of different travel styles there are. And I wonder if there are other um differences or similarities in travel style that have been particularly important during the many trips the two of you have taken absolutely if if one is accustomed to say resorts and having everything you could possibly want all in one place and daily maid service an array of restaurants just a short stroll away from one another the resort type of travel is very different from an herbal travel or from adventure travel or slow travel or solo travel and those kind of styles and what so it, we always say the why underscores everything and before we embark on any journey short or long we decide our why for that what do we want to learn what do we want to experience what do we want to see and why And we often build it around a theme and let the experience unfold there too. Will you give us an example? I will give you an example. We took a road trip, the classic Route 66, Mm -hmm. and we drove it the entire way from Chicago west to Santa Monica, where it ends. We did that in a brand new Cadillac, Cadillac, a white, Cadillac with what 
Five miles. Mm -hmm. It had five miles in it. And when we dropped it off at the end of the trip, it had 3,000 miles on it. We did it the old-fashioned way. We did it with paper maps. We did it without GPS. No technology allowed during the day. And often, because we stayed in motels along the way, along the route, there was often not Wi-Fi available at night either. And because many of the stretches of the entire route have little cellular coverage, you could not depend on that either. And we did it because we wanted our why was to see and taste and engage and understand America off the highway, America the way it was. And that's just what we did for three thousand miles and a lot of people have photographed route 66 there's been a lot of restoration along the route and there's bright neon and beautiful colors and we saw quite a bit of that but we also saw a lot more because if you follow the oldest tracks of the route because it was aligned and realigned many times between the time that it opened and the time that it was decommissioned. Those oldest tracks have not been restored and they've been bypassed, but people still live there. And so when people use the hashtag, you know, abandoned places, um, they're not abandoned and life still goes on. And it speaks to resilience. It speaks to autonomy. And most importantly, the why of Route 66, the meaning, the resonance of Route 66 is hope. That's the story of Route 66. And that's what we discovered mile after mile after mile along the route. And that was an extraordinary journey, wasn't it? It was truly a route of discovery. That was the, the only itinerary was when we picked up the car in Chicago. And we knew in about two and a half weeks we had to be in California because it was my birthday and we had a, a special stay in California. Um, otherwise, we didn't plan anything. Every day we drove uh, until we were done driving or ran out of time or hit the right spot. We had no idea what hotel would stay on any night. We had no research about what hotels were were because we didn't know what markers we would hit on that day. Some some days we traveled only 50 miles uh, because there's so much to see and so many things to pull over and photograph or engage with locals in, in restaurants and whatnot. So the, the, the whole idea was just experience. It's, it's part of our philosophy of slow travel or immersive, immersive right. travel where you immerse yourself into the history and the culture of the people that you're with. And therefore, you're another local, not a tourist just who's coming in and out. And we, um, and that was a very memorable trip because we didn't know what we would see on any one day. We had some ideas of some of the bigger monuments, uh, but really a lot of it was um, un unveiled to us as we traveled. And many of the things actually that we really enjoyed were never covered in any of the books that we read or any of the guides that we saw, or sometimes not even on the map. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for example, um, there's these ghost towns in Oklahoma where a lot of people have left and maybe like 10% of the population still resides in any one of those places. And you know, that wasn't something that we had come really across in our in our research. I mean, to some degree, a little bit, but when you experience them, when you view that, and when you drive through a town and you see one family living in the street out of 15 houses that are empty, it's, it's it really impacts you in a very different way. Can you say how it impacted you? Well, it's, it's, uh, it just shows you that the, that history, that time marches on and time doesn't wait. But it also shows you that some people are resilient in 
you know, their loyalty or their roots or um, whatever kept them in those spots, right? And a lot of people left because the, the highway took away jobs and, you know, they just moved on with the highway. But other people who had, you know, pride of place or pride of uh, their roots stayed where they were. And that's not necessarily an easy life, but it is a meaningful life. You know, when, oh, go ahead, Marilee, please. There's, there's a certain motel along the way. And I've seen it many times on the gram, typically with those, you know, hashtag abandoned places. Uh, it's, it's not abandoned. It looks abandoned. It looks run down. There's a couple of beat up cars that are parked. It was, it was obviously an old motor court hotel where you'd, you'd park your car in a little portico share right next to the, the door of your, your room. But what we saw as we were driving past re required us, it demanded us to turn around and, and capture what we saw as we drove past and what we saw. Alexandra was yellow ribbons tied around this huge old oak tree in the front yard. And we saw a little tricycle and we saw a swing suspended from that tree. There was life in that rundown hotel. There was a child, if not children, in that rundown hotel. And that again, we saw the hope. There was a bathtub out on the lawn, an old bathtub, but it wasn't abandoned. It was planted with flowers. It, it moved us. It touched us. It brought tears to our eyes. And so we captured, all well, captured, the hope that was present there. And then we got back into the Cadillac and we moved on. And so our experience, seeing this place through our lens of resilience and hope and pride in your place, influenced how we saw the entire route from end to end. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I lived in rural Kansas for two years, my family near three miles from Oklahoma, near Colorado and Texas. And there's a way in which the parts of the country you're describing remind me of how in the desert there are these beautiful flowers that are easy to ignore if you just look at the desert as a relatively monotone expanse. But then once you pay attention, there are all kinds of interesting things happening. And that's the image that came to mind hearing you speak. You know, I, I'm not. I don't go chasing the kinds of the kinds of things that I'm about to ask, but I'm very curious to know in the context of growth and learning, do you have any stories about travel fights? Because I think travel is a time when there's certain kinds of fights that can erupt. Has that been part of your experience? I can't recall one. Can you? No. 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 I assume you're not often both speechless. So this no, is all so worthy. We, all in all, we really haven't had many fights in our life. But I cannot recall once fighting while traveling. We've been tired. We've been exhausted. We've been disappointed. We've been um, we've been hurt by things that happened. Um, we've been stranded to some degree, um, but I, I never recall an instance where we were turning on each other or unhappy with each other. Um, I think some of our happiest moments are on the road. Maybe we don't fight when we're traveling because for us, Alexandra, travel is the ultimate self-care. Mm -hmm. Yes. It is so deeply, richly, meaningfully, soul satisfying. Now there have been times when I'll go back to Route 66. 
So we'd we'd been on the road for days and we would stop, as I said, and we would we would not go on to the interstate, which essentially parallels much of, of 66, to find a brand hotel. We would stay at a little motel and some of them had been restored and were wonderful and others were not. And I reached a point where I said, I need to have some four or five star luxury right now, or I don't know if I can keep going on in the same mindset. And so we we pulled over. We, we were in New Mexico. Yeah. So luckily, Santa Fe was only like maybe half an hour or mm-hmm. an hour detour. Um, so we went to Santa Fe, That's found, I right. uh, forget what hotel we stayed. Right. We don't we won't mention brand names, um, but it was. It was a luxury hotel and we pulled right in without reservations and uh, we stayed there so I could recover. So that was not a fight, but it was it was a complete change. A moment of tension. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, Alexandra, um, Santa Fe is on one of the old alignments. So we we were able to remain on the route, as it were. Yes. Yeah. Technically, we were still on the route. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. So a little room service and a luxury high thread count Italian linens uh, can go a long way to uh, pressing the reset button. Absolutely. Rebuild the reserves. Reclaim uh-huh. the reserves. Uh-huh. Every couple that I interview, I ask one question that's the same. And that is because I believe that intimate relationships are really the ultimate vehicle for personal growth. So I would love to ask you, Paul, what have you learned about yourself as a result of being married to Marilyn? That's a good question. So all my life, I've been in positions of of leadership. I have a natural leadership um, ability. And from Boy Scouts to the corporate world, I've always been in the, in, in the lead. But with Married with Mary Lee, I often want... I often want her to take the leadership or take or not make the decision, but um, voice her preference, voice her opinion. But ultimately what it has done, it has made me a better person because I want to um, I want to be a better person. I want to be a better person for Mary Lee. And even though I was, I've always been um, a leader, I haven't always been aggressive in pursuing you know positions or or fame or or anything like that um i've been in a position i've been kind of like a quiet leader where you know it's, you still command the situation but you're not doing it for any accolades or or any any personal gain but being married to mary lee i want to accomplish more i i want to do more um and i want to do that because i want her to uh, first of all, have the benefit of that, but also uh, be proud of what I have done and what I have accomplished. So I've become um, more, uh, the word is escaping me right now. But Ambitious? I, pardon me? Ambitious? Yes, that, thank you. It was, I've become more ambitious because of our marriage, whereas before I, I had many successes, but I was almost passive in the pursuit of those successes. Uh, and since our, our marriage, I have not been as passive. I have been more proactive in pursuing things. What a beautiful response. Wow. And you can't see, but this is an emotional moment there. The way that Marilee is responding with an embrace and Paul is feeling a lot right now. Am I right? That is correct. Yes. Yes. And we're not going to start a whole second podcast <laughs> right now, but I do want to say, Marilee, there is a whole cohort of women who would love to know how it is that you've created this, how you've been the inspiration, and this has been the response that your man has become more ambitious. And the way you speak about that, Paul, is so, so beautiful because 
you're describe you're speaking of it in a way that reflects you being more true to yourself. It's not that you're doing this for Mary Lee. It's that through being married to Mary Lee and sharing a life together and traveling together, you're actually more authentically self-expressed. Those were all my words, so I want to ask if that feels true, but I'm I'm saying it as a reflection of what I experienced as you shared your answer. No, I think you nailed it, the nail on the head right there. It's exactly exactly what I feel. Well, I would love to ask you, Marilee, what have you learned about yourself as a result of being married to this remarkable man? He is a remarkable man. I'm so glad that you see that, Alexandra, because he he is a gift from God. And over especially the, the last few years, our faith has become so much stronger and our marriage has become so much stronger and So what have, would you kindly repeat the question, Alex? I'm a little, little overcome right now. So I want to, no, I want to hone back no, in. I want to hone no, back in. Well, you don't really need to. It's all right. And the question is, what have you learned about yourself as a result of being married to Paul? I have learned to trust my instincts more to speak in the voice of who I am authentically and not what other people want me to be, to stand with both feet firmly on the ground and to bend with the blows that life rains upon us all, but not to break. There have been times in my life when I thought I was going to break. And through faith and through hope and through love, true love, I myself have become more resilient, more strong, and a better person. And having given the visual description of what was happening after Paul spoke. I need to do that after you spoke, Marilee, not for the sake of parody, but because it's also so meaningful to see Paul's like sunshine in his face as he nods affirmation to what you shared. Yes. Well, this is one of those beautiful moments in conversation, which is both a moment of completion and it also feels like a moment of opening and beginning and i'd like to transition and invite you to share the gift you have for anyone listening oh thank you alexandra well you you began this conversation with stating what for us is the very foundation the foundational purpose of why and who and how we are and what we do. Because meaningful travel is part of a meaningful life and stories, your stories, enrich the meaning. That is true for your story as a professional and that is true as a story for you as a person. And oftentimes we don't know where to begin telling our story, particularly if we have lived full and rich and robust lives. Where do we begin? So we created a a tip sheet with simple ways to hone in on your story, your spotlight story, and to tell it simply and easily. Our stories are our identity. They're our narrative. And they're also our legacy. We pass them down just as the ancient did. The ancients told stories 
to stir emotion, to create connection, and to convey history and legacy. And for those of us who are professionals, especially we as professional women, our stories establish credibility as well. So we created this guide, guide down so this tip sheet. Let's call it a tip sheet. Tips to tell your story, not your employer's story, not your employer's brand, not anything else but yours. Not the family narrative you were always handed either. It sounds- exactly. Exactly. Okay, well, I'm definitely going to download it. And it's such a beautiful gift because the two of you have been modeling it throughout this conversation. So thank you. Hope everyone signs up and starts telling more thoughtful stories and creating more thoughtful stories. I'm, I'm really, in, I'm very intentional about all kinds of things, but I have a whole new vision for what I would want to personally with my husband and then with my whole family do before any trip going forward. So this is, this has been just a really, um, I don't know. It, 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 this conversation has touched me in places that are typically dormant. And so I'm very grateful for that. Any last words you'd like to say as I share my gratitude for the two of you taking time for this conversation. Paul, anything? The journey is the destination. It's greater getting there than being there. And that really guides a lot of how we think and we travel and how we collect moments. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and please leave a rating and a review. And if you're ready to deepen your relationship and create a truly intimate, delicious, and vibrant marriage, head over to the work with me page at alexandrastockwell.com and choose the program that's right for you.